Hi, I'm Michelle Leifer, and I'm the director of the USDAN Institute for Animal Health Education at the Animal Medical Center in New York City. I'd like to welcome everyone to tonight's event, Pet Behavior and the Pandemic. Um, we're excited to be partnering with the Cornell University Hospital for Animals for tonight's event. Uh, and I'd like to thank Sarah Bassman and Dr. Meg Thompson from Cornell for helping to coordinate, as well as my colleague, Kimberly Young, and our veterinary advisor, Dr. Ann Hohenhaus. So we first started talking about doing this lecture last April, never imagining at the time that we would still be in this pandemic a year later. Um, and not surprisingly, there's tremendous interest in this topic, and we're so happy that so many of you could join us. Um, this event will be recorded and we'll send out a link tomorrow. So in case you miss anything or would like to watch it again, uh, we'll be taking questions via chat and we ask that you please save your questions until the end of the presentation and we will get to as many as possible. I'd like to let everyone know about an upcoming event on travel and summer safety with Dr. Carly Fox from AMC's Emergency and Critical Care Service. Um, that will be held on Thursday, May 13th, and you can register at amcny.org slash events, and you'll find the link in our newsletter that goes out tomorrow night. And now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. Dr. Hap Cap Dr. Catherine Haupt received her veterinary degree and her PhD from the University of Pennsylvania and is board certified by the American College of Veterinary Behaviorists. She specializes in the treatment of behavior problems in animals, primarily dogs, cats, and horses. She directed the Animal Behavior Clinic and taught at Cornell's College of Veterinary Medicine, where she is James Law Professor of Behavior Medicine Emeritus. Dr. Haupt has authored a textbook entitled Domestic Animal Behavior for Veterinarians and Animal Scientists, which is now in its sixth edition. Um, our other speaker, uh, Dr. Kate Anderson, graduated from Cornell's College of Veterinary Medicine in 2008 and is currently a resident with the American College of Veterinary Behaviorists. She has a diverse background, having worked with both large and small animals. In addition to general practice and emergency work, she sees behavior cases in both private practice and at Cornell. Dr. Anderson is a fear-free certified professional and she lives in Ithaca with her husband and their dog, Ernie. So now, um, thank you both for making the time to lead tonight's event. Um, Dr. Anderson will be speaking first. So welcome, Dr. Kate Anderson. Thank you, can you hear me okay? Sound great, yeah. All right, let me just share my screen. So I'm Dr. Anderson. Um, let me just rearrange some things. So there's no doubt that um, 2020 and now going into 2021, um, it's been filled with change for both people and their pets due to the pandemic. Um, and hopefully things are going to get back to more normal soon. And so um, my goal tonight is to focus on how to prepare for that. Um, whether you're returning to work outside the home or at least spending more time outside the home and leaving your pets home alone more than they have been in the past year. Um, this is all new for a lot of us, so we're obviously learning as we go, and I obviously don't have all the answers, but I want to spend some time talking about what we do know, um, what we can do now despite certain limitations, and how we might prepare for the coming year as things continue to change. Um, before I dive too much into the behavior side of things, I want to point out that um, any change in your pet's behavior um, is an indication for a physical exam by a veterinarian. Um, some of the signs of separation anxiety um, that I'll get into later, for example, urinating in the house um, could be due to an underlying medical issue, which needs to be diagnosed and treated appropriately um, and would uh, not be rewarding, would not be rewarding to treat it as a behavioral problem. Um, any condition that leads to increase in pain and discomfort um, can also um, appear consistent with anxiety. So um, that's also something to consider. Um, diseases of the sensory system, internal organs, nervous system, anything else going on um, can all contribute to change in behavior. So I'm not going to specifically address all of the medical causes that we think about for separation anxiety today, but I wanted to remind everyone that that should always be a consideration. Um, I'll go into a little more detail on each of these, but I think um, 
I'm going to start out talking about things that we can do for our pets. Um, maybe they have no history of separation anxiety and they never had a problem, but I think it's still important to be ready for upcoming changes and make that um, go as smoothly as possible. So if you're still working from home and you're going to be moving to working outside the home, you know, start to plan as soon as possible, um, set a consistent routine, increase your pet's independence and monitor for problems going forward. Um, so I'll discuss a little bit of these in more detail. Um, I would recommend, and this is probably actually good for humans too, but I think it's good for our pets to stick to a workday routine as much as possible. You know, use an area separate from your pet if you're working from home and that's something that's not gonna continue past the pandemic. You could also practice departures and then go for a walk or run errands. Um, it might help to give a high value or really yummy safe treat or toy when you leave. So your pet associates that with your leaving and has a positive association. Um, I would strongly recommend getting a camera if you're at all worried. It's really the only way to know what's going on when you're not home. Um, and there are really many affordable options these days. There's lots of different ones that can work with your smartphone. Um, there's ones that have noise alerts, motion alerts, um, and you can use the camera to establish a baseline and kind of be assured that really your pet is doing fine when you're not home, or you might catch up, catch early changes and subtle signs that your pet may be struggling. Um, some cameras have a feature where you can talk to your pet, and I, I wouldn't recommend doing that because that may contribute to anxiety. I, it's not something that we really know for sure, but they may perceive that you're not there and then get anxious about that because they can hear you. Um, one tool that I really like for increasing independence and helping pets learn to relax is um, mat training or, you know, a calm settle. Um, and if you are still experiencing extended time at home, this is a great opportunity to work on mat training. Um, it gives your pet, um, cats too, I'm sorry, I don't have any pictures of cats, I think Dr. Haupt will. Um, it's a safe base that they can use to build independence, teach them how to relax. Um, give them a behavior to perform that's incompatible with bothering you and looking for attention for you from you or other unwanted behaviors. Um, it's really important when you start mat training that your dog is relaxed and um, ready to work. If we're stressed or anxious, it's really hard for us to learn. Um, and you should keep the sessions really short, make it part of your daily routine. Maybe while you're waiting for some water to boil or something to heat up in the microwave, have the mat nearby and do um, some rewarding for your pet going on the mat. You can also do it um, in a way that we sometimes call passive training, where you don't really um, actively teach your dog to go on the mat, but you just catch them there, give them a reward, and then kind of calmly walk away. Um, they may get up and follow you around and want more treats, but just sort of calmly wait it out, wait for them to go back to the mat, and then reward that again. Um, the pictures here, there's a cute little puppy starting mat training, and then the cot with the legs, I with the canvas top, I really like that for dogs that um, chew on beds or like to chew up things that have stuffing. So that can work really well. And some dogs that are too hot to sleep on a bed um, prefer those, they can be a little cooler. Um, so there's lots of different options. It doesn't have to be a mat. You could just reinforce them for lying calmly somewhere, but the mat gives them a visual cue of to where they're supposed to go. I think for all dogs during a pandemic and at all times, it's really important to provide predictability. Dogs like to know what's expected of them and what to expect in life. Um, they like to know that certain behavior is gonna earn them good things. So asking them to sit, to say please, um, when they come back inside, when they, when they get their dinner, when they are about to go outside, um, it's important that everyone in the family be on board and be clear and consistent and try to all use the same words and the same way of asking your dog to do things and reward the same behaviors. Um, also setting them up for success. There's many, many options for this. For me, I always think about puppies with shoes. You know, if there's something you don't want your puppy to chew on, don't have it in their environment. They don't know the difference between a chew toy and a shoe until they get a little bit older. So pick up your kid's toys, pick up the shoes, or put them somewhere where the only things in their environment are things that they can um, play with and chew on. Um, but also other things can help them, um, blocking views of things that trigger barking, um, playing the radio or white noise machine so that they're, you know, the noises in the hallway are a little bit muffled. Um, and being calm and quiet helps. You don't necessarily need to shout to get the right behavior. 
And another one I really like is reinforcing your dog for looking at you um, so that they look to you for guidance. Um, in general, it's really helpful to teach your dog what to do, not what not to do. Dogs aren't very good at figuring out how not to do something. And we have a tendency as humans, sometimes that's our first reaction to say no or off or don't. Instead, ask them for sit, stay, down, things that they can do and know how to do and we can reward. Um, another great thing, I think Dr. Hupp's gonna talk about this a little bit more is mental stimulation and enrichment. I think this has really been important during the pandemic. We've all got a little bit of cabin fever. We're maybe limited in how much we can go outside. Um, and I think um, physical exercise as well as mental stimulation for both cats and dogs can really help improve their behavior and give them a more enriched life. So they they're busy with food puzzle toys or different games um, so that they have a, a, an outlet for their energy throughout the day. Okay, right now I'm gonna shift gears and talk more specifically specifically about dogs that might have separation anxiety and sometimes cats, although it's less common. Um, I think the reason some um, experts are concerned about an increasing incidence of separation anxiety, or at least being prepared for it, is that we do often see separation anxiety in dogs after some kind of change. So if a person has an injury in his home for four to six weeks and then goes back to work, that may trigger separation anxiety. A school teacher home for the summer and then going back to school in the fall may trigger separation anxiety. Um, so we've all kind of been in that mode now as a, as a country, as, as the world almost, um, where we've, we've had a massive change in everyone's routine um, and we've all been home for an extended period of time. Um, so it's important to be prepared for that and try to educate people about that as things go forward. So, um, you know, other things that can trigger separation anxiety outside of the pandemic as well are moving to a new house, a new baby, um, medical and cognitive disorders are well, uh, as well are things to consider. Um, so as I was saying before, if you suspect your dog has separation anxiety, get a camera as soon as possible and set that up. Um, you know, we, we might come home and find evidence of, um, that our pet was upset or we might, the neighbors might tell us that they heard barking, um, but you're not really going to be able to figure it out unless you get some data and see what your dog is doing when you're not home. Um, it seems like a really straightforward diagnosis. Um, it's basically recurrent distress associated with the absence or perceived absence of an attachment figure. And sometimes it can be a single person. So even if someone's home with the dog, but their person is at home, they can be in distress. Um, sometimes they're fine as long as someone is home with them. And it's the second most common thing we see in behavior specialty practice. Um, so the kind of behaviors you might see, it might begin just before or just after you leave. Um, they, you might see destructive behavior, digging, scratching, chewing, um, vocalization like barking, whining, howling. Um, an animal that's normally house trained um, might urinate or defecate. Um, and if it's happening consistently when no one is home, then we're more likely to suspect separation anxiety um, as opposed to them just not being house trained. Um, panting, salivating. Um, for cats specifically too, urinating or defecating outside the litter box could be the only um, sign that you see. Um, and then there's a lot of other behaviors that are less common and more unusual that you might want to see, you know, seek guidance from a professional to figure out if they're related to separation anxiety or not, such as um, licking, grooming, um, pacing. Um, even some dogs can display aggression, biting at owners right as they're getting ready to leave. Um, and signs can sometimes be cyclical in nature, so that they can range from like 20 minutes to an hour, and sometimes it'll go in sort of a cycle, and sometimes noises outside can sort of lead to rearousal, and it'll start all over again. So it's important to realize that you don't have to fix this all by yourself. There is help available. Um, they, the best place to start is your primary care veterinarian, depending on your dog's clinical signs or what you're seeing with your cat. Um, they may feel comfortable treating it. They may be able to give you recommendations that get you started on treatment. Um, but if they're not comfortable, they may be able to refer you to a board certified veterinary behaviorist. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, these days, unfortunately, board certified veterinary behaviorists are not in every part of the country. Um, but if your primary care veterinarian is willing and there's no 
um, behaviorist in your area, there are vet to vet consults that can be done. So I think oh, no matter where you are, especially with technology these days, there is a way to get help in some form. Um, the treatment is obviously going to be tailored to your specific pet, but it might include management, behavior modification, and medication as recommended. I'll talk a little bit more about that. So one of the things that you might be asked to do when you have a dog with separation anxiety is to try to keep your schedule as consistent as possible. Um, like I said before, with you know most dogs, you know I think consistency really helps. But dogs with separation anxiety, especially in the beginning, as we're getting treatment started, <clears throat> you want to try not to come and go a lot. Um, I had one case where the family was very worried about the dog being left home alone and they knew he had separation anxiety. So everyone was stopping by to check on him periodically throughout the day. And I think that was actually making it worse. So obviously your dog needs adequate bathroom breaks and someone should come and let the dog out for that. But um, coming and going to check on them may actually worsen the behavior because they go through that cycle every time someone arrives and then leaves. Um, you might wanna consider taking your dog with you on errands if that's feasible or getting a pet sitter, daycare, or recruiting family members until you can get help, especially if it's an unsafe situation for your dog. Um, in treating separation anxiety, we often recommend um, specific behavior modification. And behavior modification is something that looks very similar to training, um, but it's a little bit different. We're more focused on your dog's emotional state and how they're feeling about things. And so it's more um, exercises to help um, calm them down, not panic about your departure. And this is gonna be tailored to you and your pet and specifically what's going on. And a lot of thinking about these things changes over the years. So this is not absolute, you know, what you have to do, but this is some things that have been tried and have been successful with some dogs. So rewarding relaxation and independence, like I talked about with the mat training. Um, departure and pre-departure cues. This is where we, um, if we have a dog who immediately you know, gets anxious and panics when you pick up your keys, you might try once a night picking up your keys, but then going to sit on the sofa and not leaving. So your dog stops monitoring your behavior to see when you're going to be leaving. Um, in general, it helps to just keep everything kind of low key as you're coming and going, not make a big fuss. It's not a good time to start a fun game or do something, you know, that's going to get your dog really excited. You want to make it sort of a non-event and be calm. Um, and some people do sort of gradual departures where they leave for short amounts of time and gradually work up to longer. Um, and that can work for some dogs and not others. I've had some dogs where they seem to get even more anxious every time um, they go through that. So sometimes it can actually um, be too arousing for the dog and not helpful. So I think it, it really depends on the dog, how we tailor that. Uh, medication is available um, and should be included in a, a complete treatment plan. So medications um, can decrease fear and anxiety. They can facilitate learning and they can improve your animal's well-being. Um, they shouldn't be seen as just a band-aid or, you know, our goal is not to sedate the animal into feeling well. We actually want to um, have them be less panicked and afraid when they're left at home. Um, but it should be included with, you know, safety management and behavior modification. Um, I think the big question with a lot of behavioral problems is, you know, what's going to happen? Will it get better? Um, and certainly, um, in similar to people who struggle with emotional disorders, we don't have any easy cures. Um, but I think for separation anxiety, the outlook is pretty good, especially if it started recently. Um, so I think it's important to realize that um, monitoring is really important and seeking help as soon as you feel that there's a problem. Um, because that gives you the best chance of succeeding. Um, it's also, the outlook is also good if your pet doesn't have any other ongoing anxiety disorders and if you're really motivated to help change. Um, unfortunately, this is something that um, we can't as veterinarians do for you. It's not a surgery or something where we can um, give you back your pet fixed. Um, it, we're more here to coach you and guide you through the treatment plan. So your involvement is really important. But if it's not successful, it doesn't mean it's not your fault. There, there's a lot of things that go into it. Um, and some dogs will improve, but they'll require long-term treatment to maintain control. Um, but I do have many patients that will be gradually tapered off medication within about a year of starting treatment once their behavior has been stable for at least a month. So 
um, I think it's always worth trying to treat. And in the same vein, um, it's important to think about ongoing treatment and also prevention when you get a new dog, um, as we are now with the pandemic and people are getting adopting more dogs, um, it seems. And if you get a puppy, you know, it's important to think about all these things too, like I talked about in the beginning. Um, you want to get them used to being independent, um, you know, set them up with their uh, crate in the morning and a long lasting treat. So they have kind of a schedule and a routine and they know what to expect and they feel they don't panic if they're left alone. Um, and make changes in your routine slowly if possible. Um, if you have a dog that suffered with separation anxiety but's currently stable, but you know that you're moving or you know there's going to be some change coming up, don't wait till then to try to fix things. You know, sometimes medications can take several weeks to start working. Um, so try to plan a couple months ahead of any change and try to get um, you know, a plan in place at that time to try to help smooth that transition. I think that was all I had. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. And Dr. Hout, I'd love to have you present next. Thank you. All right. So people have been, I see on the chat, have, are afraid we're going to neglect cats, but we're not. So lots of people have been complaining about cats and COVID because cats love keyboards. They think they're a chaise lounge. And um, so they will decide that the shift key means to settle in and change positions. Z means to catch some Zs. Control key means you rule. Option means walk on or take a nap and so on. Um, so why do cats do this? Well, sometimes it's maybe just to drive you crazy. This is the poor guy who is saying, I think you could step on the keyboard exactly as you did. Why is it doing that? Um, when the set password window was open. Uh, that may be a little difficult. And this slide shows someone who's really desperate to keep their cat off his computer, especially during his Zoom call. I don't recommend this. This is not nice. But some people are really upset by their cat's behavior. So why are cats so interested in our computers? Well, they're nice and warm, for one thing. So what can you do? Well, first you have to pet your cat so that he's had his morning grooming session. Then provide him with a really soft bed close to that nice warm computer. And then you have a chance of having a couple of hours of cat-free work. We're not the only ones whose cats are on our screens. Uh, this is a PBS uh, radio, uh, PBS um, news hour with Lisa Desjardins and her cat, who is almost always in her, her videos, and William Brangham with his two cats. And I've only heard this cat meow a couple of times. But cats may misbehave. And one of the misbehaviors uh, which can occur with separation anxiety or just in general for cats is urinating outside the litter box. Uh, and I don't think this should be a death sentence, but it is for many cats. So with any problem, as Dr. Anderson said, as you should have a veterinary examination, especially with feline house soiling, a medical cause has to be ruled out. And if your cat is urinating in the bathtub or in the sink, uh, that is a cool surface. And it may indicate that the cat uh, is uncomfortable and the cool surface feels good. So whisk him off to your vet. What's really important is litter box hygiene. Uh, litter, the reason they will avoid the litter box is it isn't clean. There's a problem with the pan or there's a problem with the number of pans versus the number of cats. You should have a box per cat plus one. Uh, this is a litter that I don't uh, uh, think most cats like because it's pellets. They don't like pellets. They like sandy, small grains. What is really important is cleanliness. You should um, scoop the litter every day and replace it every couple of weeks. 
That means throwing it out and replacing it with new litter and washing the pan with some mild soap. Location aversions are pretty common, and this is an example. Oh dear, he took out the important thing. Uh, there's a washing machine here, and this washing machine had not been in use because the couple were just a couple. And so they do the wash maybe once a week. Now they have a baby and the washing machine is running at least once a day and it makes a lot of noise. And the litter box is right next to that washing machine. So the cat avoids it. The owners said, well, the cat doesn't like the baby. The cat is jealous. No, the cat just didn't like the, that noise. And so all you have to do is to move the litter box away from the offending machine. There's also substrate aversion, and that can occur if any of these things are wrong from the cat's point of view. The consistency, as I said, they like this fine grained litter, the texture um, and the size of the clump of the granules. They like clumping litter, just like we do. Um, tracking, I don't think the cats care about tracking, but of course we do because we have to sweep up after them. Scent, we used to think that cats were repelled by fragrant litters, but we now think that doesn't really matter. Dustiness, that matters to the cat with respiratory problems, but probably not in general, it matters to us. Depth is very important. In general, cats prefer a deeper layer of litter, but you can make a swimming pool with a shallow end and a deep end and let the cat tell you what he or she likes. This is an all too common cause of house soiling. This poor cat is afraid to leave the litter box because this cat will jump on her. And so next time she's just going to use the rug because she won't be ambushed by the other cat. So be sure that you know what the dynamics are between your cats. And it also means that you should have that second and third litter box because you have two cats. Perching, if you have a cat who perches on the litter box, if you look closely, you can see that all four feet are on this edge. And that's because the cat does not want to step in this litter for some reason. The only cats that have to be house trained are orphan kittens, which indicates that somehow the mother cat is teaching the kittens that this is a place to eliminate. Don't punish your cat. Don't punish your dog either for urinating in the wrong place. Don't rub the cat's nose in it. Don't shout at them uh, because that will make the cat afraid of you and it won't encourage it to use the litter box. Size matters. The pan should be one and a half times the length of the cat. So obviously this is too small a box for this cat. Uh, and this is the right size. Don't include their tail in the one and a half times the length. Uh, the food is there just so the cat will stay in the litter box long enough to be photographed. Now, if this were a smaller crowd, I would do a test to see which box you think the cats prefer. But in general, uh, in fact, almost always, cats prefer an open box. Uh, the closed box doesn't allow the cat to look around like the poor cat that was being ambushed. But more importantly, the closed box holds in the odor. I had a video of a cat <clears throat> who walked up to the box, put his head in and went like this, and then walked a few feet from the box and urinated. So, because it smelled bad. If it smells bad to you, which is probably why you have the top on it, uh, it's gonna smell worse to the cat. So in general, cats do not like covered boxes. Um, if it's aesthetically unpleasing to you to see urine and feces in the box, scoop the litter. Uh, Cats don't like this kind of litter. Uh, if you pour water or urine on it, it hisses and gets warm, which the cats probably don't like. And light litter. 
I mean, I hate bringing litter home from the grocery store, it weighs a ton. Um, so people were very enthusiastic about lightweight litter, but their cats were not. Fresh Step Bolty Cat is one that cats seem to like. Can you so, say, I'm sorry, I'm curious about that. What is it about the lightweight? I think that, that they can't dig properly. You know, they want to get their claws into something. So that's a very good question. So if you have a cat that is not using the litter, uh, you can try the store brands Evercleaner, Tidy Cat, <clears throat> But Cat Attract um, is a litter that most cats like. Um, I suspect it has catnip in it, and it was invented by a veterinarian, so it must be okay. So I would try that. Exquisite Cat is another clumping, unscented litter uh, that you might want to try. So I'll move on to feline aggression, which does occur. So if the cat is aggressive to you, and that's all I'm going to talk about, um, I'm not going to talk about the birds and the other cats and so on that the cat might be aggressive to, but enrichment helps because most cat aggression is predatory behavior. Uh, it may be play, but it still hurts because it's your ankles that are being bitten and scratched. Uh, this is a cat dancer. It's just a wire with these little rolls of paper at the end, but the wire seems to bounce in a way that cats find irresistible and they will play with this for a long period of time. Lasers, don't use a laser on a dog because some fraction of them uh, may develop a obsessive behavior toward lights in general. Uh, but cats don't seem to do that. Uh, so you can exercise them, enrich them with a laser. Some people say you should uh, at the end point the laser at some food or at least at a cat and a mouse so the cat seems to have won. I'm not sure that's necessary. Here's another enrichment tool. This is a no bowl feeder. You put kibble here and you hide these mice around the house and the cat has to find the mouse and get this kibble out. Then of course you have to find the mice to, to refill them. I like this one. It's called Pavlov's cat because when it scratches on this, some food drops out. So <clears throat> you can establish leadership. Uh, you could obedience train the cat, and I'll show you the one that works best for me at least. Uh, some people say don't let the cat lick you, probably because the cat goes lick, 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 bite. I think they're just tasting you. Limit petting, and the reason for that is some cats bite when they're petted. So you have to reward tolerance of petting. One stroke and they get a treat. And then tomorrow, two strokes and they get a treat. And also be sure that you're petting the cat in the right place. They love to be petted under their chins, uh, on their cheeks. They don't like to have their shoulders petted. They certainly don't like to be petted on their rumps um, and definitely don't pet their stomachs, even if they're rolling over looking absolutely irresistible. So if you have a cat that actually has bitten you, uh, you can save yourself by having a laundry basket in every room that you can put over the cat. Then you can push the laundry basket with the cat under it into a room, turn off the lights, leave the cat alone in the dark for an hour or two, then come back. And if the cat is calm, its pupils aren't dilated, uh, and it'll take food or it approaches with her tail up, uh, then it's probably safe to let the cat out. And then there's the obedience training. Uh, with cats, you don't have to lure them uh, because all you have to do is to put a tea towel or a placemat down on the floor and for some reason cats will go and stand on that or usually sit on, which is what you want. So when the cat does that, you give it a treat uh, and practice that, you know, a few times a day. And when the cat is being aggressive, you just toss that uh, placemat across the room. The cat runs there and sits down while you escape from the cat. And it's a fun uh, parlor trick for the cat too. But what about dogs? 
We've heard a lot about German Shepherd aggression lately. And one thing people ask about in COVID is do masks frighten cats? So you see a lot of different masks here, but depends on the mask. Because when this gentleman came home wearing this mask, uh, when his bulldog saw him, uh, she lay down and growled, and this was a very friendly bulldog. So she thought a giant bulldog was coming. What about the clinical problem of aggression? All too common. If you're in New York City, there are behavior vets whose motto is worry less, wag more. Uh, the, one of my residents uh, is now board certified and she owns this practice. So let's start with biting you. There are just some common sense things that we can all do. If the dog resource guards, if you drop something, if the dog stands over it and will bite you if you try to take it away, don't take things away from the dog. Uh, I always say if it's worth more than $50, you can try to lure him away, but otherwise let him have it. And if you're worried, that he's going to hurt himself by chewing up plastic or eating the chicken. Just remember that your dog's life is more likely to be shortened if he bites you than if he eats that bone. There's an old saying, let sleeping dogs lie, and that's based on fact that some dogs, when you disturb them when they're resting, will bite you. Uh, it can be a sleep disorder or you've just awakened the dog when it was in the middle of an aggressive dream where it was biting and you woke it up and it bit you. So always call the dog, uh, don't startle it. So for aggression in general, my first rule is let's protect the victim. Uh, and we'll talk about muzzles and head halters, leashes and confinement particularly because this is bite prevention week. And you know who in the White House would not have hurt those people if he had been wearing a muzzle. Muzzles don't make dogs worse. They don't make dogs better, but they keep the dog from biting. All muzzles aren't the same. This is a sleeve muzzle. This is what your vet might use if he were, were having to do something mildly uh, painful to the dog. But these are for temporary use because a dog can't pant or drink water or get a treat very easily. Uh, so you can get a metal muzzle, you can get a plastic muzzle, um, or you can get the one that we like the best is called the Baskerville muzzle because it's padded, so it's comfortable for the dog. Uh, and you can even get muzzles to fit these flat faced dogs that we sometimes see. Oh, but the most important thing about the muzzle is when you, there are uh, lots of YouTube videos on how to get your dog to love the muzzle, which is mainly put peanut butter or cheese whiz in the muzzle until the dog sticks his face in the muzzle voluntarily. And when you put the muzzle on, don't say, oh, Thor, I'm so sorry, I have to do this to you. Say, look, Thor, we got you his beautiful new collar. And the dogs will respond accordingly. So protect the victim by avoiding the circumstances that provoke aggression. Uh, if the dog attacks the landlord, put the dog in the bedroom before the landlord comes. Uh, if you, your dog does not like small children and your grandchildren are visiting, board the dog. So let's make sure that nobody gets hurt. And avoid punishment again. If you physically punish the dog, it's been proven that the dog is then more likely to bite you. Verbal punishment, I think, tends to arouse the dog. So the dog says, woof, and you say, no. And the dog says, woof, and you say, no. Pretty soon the dog thinks that you are backing him up and you have a, he has a good reason to be so aroused. So don't yell at the dog. Get him out of the situation. So our dogs haven't seen many people during COVID and now they're going to be more visitors. Uh, but probably even during COVID, you've had plumbers come, the landlords coming. Um, and so the dog tends to be aggressive to people entering your house. So uh, there are two things you can do 
If the dog reacts to knocks and doorbells, <clears throat> ask your friends to text you uh, when they come. So you can put the dog in the other room. But meanwhile, you can teach him that doorbells mean good things. So we're going to pair food with whatever elicits aggression, which in this case is a doorbell. I'll talk more about that in a minute, but once the dog is no longer throwing himself at the door when he hears the doorbell, you can begin to teach him uh, to go to his bed or to sit and stay, any controlled behavior, and reward him for that so that he now will sit when he hears a doorbell rather than attacking the door. So you all remember Pavlov. He was a Russian physiologist who invented psychology because he found that if you had this condition stimulus, a doorbell, uh, the dog did nothing. But if you show the dog a hamburger, he would salivate like mad. So if you pair the doorbell with the hamburger, then the dog will salivate. And if he is in the mood to salivate, he is not barking and throwing himself at the door. So you do that long enough that the dog now thinks that doorbells mean good things, which gives you a chance to put the dog somewhere else when visitors come in, or you will have practiced him sitting and staying when visitors come in. So the dog is going to salivate instead of attacking the guest. And here is a, a dog that had been trained that way. He knows that when he hears this bell, which happens to be just a jingle bell, on a yogurt cup, he's going to get treats. So there he is with his gentle leader on, uh, listening to the bell. And I am coming into the house of this formerly ferocious dog who is lying on his mat, uh, waiting for the yogurt cup to give him something. Uh, he's wearing a gentle leader, which I'll talk about in, in a couple of minutes. The other common problem is aggression to people or dogs on the street, and we're probably going to see more as we gradually come out of lockdown. <clears throat> so the first thing to know is that most of the time the dog is fearful uh, rather than um, overtly aggressive. <clears throat> so you want to avoid times, and there are many dogs or people on the street. And as soon as you see an approaching dog, and your vision is better than theirs, so you're going to see the person two blocks away. Give the dog a treat. Look at that nice person, and here's a piece of chicken or whatever. The dogs will learn that that stimulus means good things, not frightening things. You can then go on to teach the dog to look at you and things like that, but it's also a good thing to get the dog away from the stimulus because direct eye contact is very threatening to dogs, is to people too. Turn the dog away from the stimulus uh, and you can teach him a command like scram or hurry up, which means let's quickly leave, uh, and then you get him away from whatever he was frightened of. So of course we've talked about muzzles, but if you're out the dog has to be on a leash, it's the law most places, uh, and not all leashes are the same. Uh, flexi leashes are great if you're all by yourself uh, out in the country, but if you have a dog that tends to be reactive, uh, he's out at the end of the flexi leash and you cannot quickly retract it. So use an ordinary leash. There are also all kinds of harnesses uh, which can control the dog, but which don't control his head. So we usually recommend these things. This is a gentle leader and this is a halty. Uh, same idea, if the dog pulls, this tightens around his nose, it should be loose normally, but if he lunges, uh, it will tighten and you can turn the dog easily towards you and away from his victim. So as Dr. Anderson said, we can use psychoactive medication. I call it better living through chemistry. It's not going to make your dog worse. We just finished a study of fluoxetine where we found that none of the dogs got worse uh, and 65% of them got better, which for behavior is very good. Uh, they're not going to make your dog into a vegetable. In the first place, half your friends are probably on these drugs and they're not too sedated. 
if the dog is sedated, the dose is too high. And the other good news is that prescription drugs are cheaper than over-the-counter preparations. So, uh, I, both of us would be happy to answer questions. Thank you so much. This was another wonderful presentation. Um, and we do have a bunch of questions. So we're going to try to get to as many as possible. Um, first one, I, um, we have a dog question, um, a VP of a small dog rescue. Um, she's worried that as people start to go back to work, they will be getting rid of their dogs who are showing behavior issues like soiling, barking. Um, any advice to the rescue, how they can take the dogs in and make things better for them? Um, you know, it's another change and then another change again. So any advice for rescues and fostering on how to stop? I know any change is hard. So how, to, how they can help with that. <laughs> it's a tough one. Well, all the things that, that I said about aggression, if the dog is aggressive, uh, could be applied. I mean, the rescue can teach the dog obedience, which will help in whatever situation they're in. And then Dr. Anderson can address how they can deal with separation anxiety. Yeah, I think getting a good history, like, you know, getting a good history from the person giving the dog back, sometimes that can help guide us because sometimes once they're in the, in the shelter, it may be hard to assess their behavior since they're going to be more stressed. So um, hopefully getting an accurate and extensive history on what was going on in the home. Um, sometimes I don't know if they have the resources, you know, depending on how bonded they are with the dog, you know, figuring out if there's um, something they can do to help the, keep the dog in that home. Cause often those, that initial adopter is, is better suit, you know, able to help the dog. But um, yeah, a lot of the things I talked about for separation anxiety help in the shelter too, um, predictability and relaxation training, um, enrichment, all of those things. It's a tough situation though. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay. Um, we have a cat question. Um, several people had asked about, um, um, Dr. Haupt, you recommended the open box, but what if your cat sprays? Um, we have someone who their cat has four legs, but only three feet. <laughs> and she has a <laughs> habit of propping her stump leg on the outside. She sprays the wall. So, um, and she runs the apartment. So how, how does she deal with this without um, having a closed box? Or does she well, have to? I mean, in, in that case, if you're <laughs> yeah. really religious about <laughs> box it might be okay but what we usually tell people to do is to go to the discount store and buy a bin uh, and make a hole for the cat to get in so now the cat has uh, four high walls um, so even if it and something to brace its leg on uh, but the whole top is open for ventilation so I think you could probably get away that cat would be happy with that that's a great tip um Okay, we have um, some questions I know about uh, leash reactivity, which is a big thing in New York City. Um, whether it's puppies who have not been around other dogs much or as people get start to get out again, um, how to deal with leash reactivity? Well, uh, make them think that anyone approaching is something good, uh, as well as having the dog under control and figuring out when you can walk the dog so it is not uh, being frightened every three steps. That's a good that's a tip. Um, we have a question that um, she has a 10 month old puppy and she lives with a group of people. So the other dog barks at random. She's been trying to teach her dog not to do that. So how do you teach a dog, I guess, to behave when they're living with roommates that are maybe a, a you know, poor influence. <laughs> so um, every single time she says someone comes in the door, they both bark. Um, I know this is a huge problem just in general in, in New York City with the barking because um, neighbors complain and, and that. So any tips on barking? Well, if you can figure out why they're barking. I mean, if there's somebody walking down the hall Maybe you can use a, uh, a, what do you call them? That uh, uh, White noise? White noise, thank you. A white noise machine um, or play, you know, music uh, 
loud enough to block noises, but not loud enough to bother your neighbors. That can help. Uh, if the dog is looking out the window, you can use a uh, window film so there's still light, but they can't see what's outside. Um, so it helps with that kind of thing. Yeah, you can teach your dog also to go to a mat, you know, acknowledge whatever they're barking at, but then quietly ask them to go to a mat and reward that. It's really hard. They can bark and do things, multiple things at the same time. So some dogs will be responsive to lying down, but they'll continue barking, but at least trying to ask for another behavior and rewarding that. So they're then figuring out why they're barking too. You know, barking can be for many different reasons. Alarm, it's usually alarm barking, like telling you someone's there, but it's also important to do a little work to figure out why your dog's barking and what specifically is triggering it and how you can change that. Right. Um, and don't use shock collars. Yes, thank yes, you don't punch. for that. <laughs> yeah. um, Okay, when practicing leaving the dog for short periods, if the dog gets unsettled just after they leave barking, should she return, stay out of the house? How long is it, you know, then that you're realizing it's an issue, you know, if they're barking? Like, should you leave for a certain amount of time? Should you go back? That type of thing. Yeah, that's a good question. I guess it depends on how, you know, because some dogs will bark for hours and hours. And there's always that thought of like, if I come back when they're barking, that I'm rewarding the barking. But I think also you have to be respectful of your neighbors and realize your dog isn't doing well. Um, so definitely if it's severe, I would seek treatment for it. Um, I do think some dogs go through a little panic and maybe quiet down. So depending on how severe the barking is, get a camera, wait it out and see if they do settle down after about 10 minutes, if that's if it's a reasonable time of day and it's not disturbing the whole neighborhood, but um, yeah, it really is a matter of how severe and, and persistent the behavior is. Because if they're barking and barking for long periods, then that needs to be addressed. Right. Yeah. No. Um, I know with the camera, also you had um, given a tip about not to talk to your dog through the camera, right, and I, Dr. Anderson. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know that anyone's really studied that, but I just don't, I just always worry that because anything that I've had dogs react when they know their owners outside a doorway or on the other side of a garage door. I had a dog destroy a garage door because they could hear the, the male owner outside. So my intuition is like, okay, don't because I have some owners who do talk through the camera. And sometimes it seems to make it worse and sometimes it doesn't matter, but I guess I would avoid doing that because I think we think we're calming the dog down and talking to them, trying to soothe them. But I think it might actually, in, in some cases it could increase their anxiety and make them feel like you're not there, but they can hear you and then they get stressed. Right now. Um, so a related topic also Dr. Anderson about the free, avoiding frequent arrivals and departures from the home. Uh, they're asking, but wouldn't that help to desensitize the dog to the absence? So it's maybe minimizing the actual departure or? Yeah, I think depending on how much work you've done with behavior modification and if you have, so that's sort of, especially in the beginning, really important um, because you're re-exposing and re-exposing without them having any ability to change their response. So they're just panicking and panicking. But once you get treatment in place and you're doing things, then yes, you can go back to more normal. But the problem is, is that the repeated exposure might only serve to make that behavior worse. Um, it's a little different than people where we can decide to expose ourselves to something. Like if you're afraid of public speaking, you can join Toastmasters and get up and give a speech multiple times and you get over your fear by exposure because you're practicing it. Um, dogs can't make that choice, so we have to do it in a more gradual way. So the the minimizing arrivals and departures is especially important in the beginning because we're trying to stop that cycle and have them continually be panicking until we have more tools at our disposal to help teach them the right way to behave. But then coming and going while they're calm can help them. Like if you leave and they're calm and they get a reward and then you come back and nothing bad happens, then they can um, improve over time that way. Would you agree, Dr. Help? I don't know if yes. you yeah. have another thing to add to that. When we desensitize and we usually say, leave and come back in, leave and come back in, leave for one minute and then come back in. And when you can get to, you know, five minutes, you can usually then leave for longer periods of time. But you, this is a dedicated to dogs audience because most of our clients are not willing to do that. Yeah. Exactly. And you also, yeah, you also want to think about the fact that like, okay, I have to do errands, like, 
go home, leave stuff, and then go back out. Like just trying to group errands together or mm -hmm. not visiting the dogs because you feel like you're going to help them. So just thinking about your schedule for that first couple months of treatment to try to make it so it's more um, structured that you and until you start all these other um, behavior modification and medication and everything else. Oh, that sounds great. Um, and I had heard also that not to make too big of a fuss when you come back inside, you know, come back home, you know, so that as excited as we are, but we just want to make it as, as if it's not a big deal, right? That you left and you came back. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you don't want to be like so aloof that you seem angry, but right. you just want to make it a non event and be right. calm and reassuring for your dog. But it's funny, it used to be keys that, you know, would trigger, you know, would trigger. now it's the mask and you see and you put on the mask, they know you're they're leaving. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, a question actually for, for Dr. Haup about a dog that is litter trained. Um, do any of the points regarding the litter and the litter box apply to dogs? Well, be because this is such a rural area, that's something that I haven't um, <laughs> encountered. Although I did have a neighbor who took all of our newspapers for her paper trained dog. Um, but um, so I don't know. I, I know the Japanese or the Koreans have a piddle pad, uh, which is held in place. That may help someone said their dog was eating the piddle pad. Well, maybe if they can't scrunch it up, they'll be less likely to eat it. Then in the middle, it had this uh, big Coke bottle uh, that the dog could lift its leg on. So maybe that would would help with dogs. Uh, there was a litter for dogs made by Purina, and I don't think it was successful because unless a dog had been trained as a puppy to use these nice little um, pellets of paper, it was very hard to train an adult dog to do that. So I, I think we're stuck with um, newspapers or piddle pads or uh, disposable diapers uh, or lots of trips outside. <laughs> That's good. Um, another sort of similar question um, about, I know you, um, Dr. Haupt, you spoke, in, you spoke about the not using the laser, the light on with dogs, which is good for cats. And they said, you know, why or uh, why is that not good? Chasing light and shadows. Oh, huh. Chasing lights or shadows? Well, yeah. because it becomes an obsessive problem in that the dog will uh, leap at the wall because he sees the lights of a passing car at night or he sees the sun coming up in the morning and he is frantic going after this light and to the point where he is not showing normal behaviors. And he may lie in front of the drawer where you keep the laser pointer, making me think that they actually are obsessing about that. But it's the uh, next to circling uh, or spinning, it's the second most common behavior problem um, of that kind, the second most common obsessive. Oh, wow. Okay. So I had a dog for 15 years with the light and shadow chasing um, compulsive disorder, and she was exposed to a laser pointer when she was a puppy. And after that, she chased flashlights and um, her shadow or ball shadow or any, any light or shadow. Um, it got better as she got older, but. Wow. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, that. Don't use it. Um, okay, um, here's uh, two male cat siblings, um, four years old, who occasionally fight and may actually draw some blood. And they're afraid that when you go back to work, they might fight more. What can they do about it? Well, I would get one of those cameras um, to see if perhaps they'll fight less. Um, I'm a, um, I mean, we. When it's a serious problem and bloodletting sounds serious, we do gradual reintroductions and we often use medication uh, to make the aggressor more uh, peaceful and the victim perhaps braver. Um, but it, when it's serious, you often have to separate the cats and then do very gradual reintroductions. Although we did solve one by getting rid of the boyfriend, but that doesn't always work. <laughs> Um, I, um, so that usually requires more than, uh, you know, a five minute consult like this. Yes. Yeah. Um, let's 
me. Can you speak a little bit, I guess, just about common issues that you are seeing now um, among patients? What are you hearing a lot of? Well, because people are still fairly uh, locked down, uh, most of us have our shots now, but we aren't running out and going to a cocktail party. Uh, mostly what I see is what I've always seen, which is aggression in dogs, uh, cats, uh, some aggression, usual house soiling sorts of things. Okay. So nothing particularly COVID related now. Oh yes, I have seen problems and that is people did adopt a lot of dogs and we see this phenomenon of what a dog comes into the household and he likes one person and is scared of the other person. And it's very hard on the relationship. And it's usually the woman that the dog likes and it's the guy he doesn't like. And that's because men are big and sometimes they have this funny hair on their face and they have deep voices. Uh, whatever it is, I'm still struggling with one which, you know, COVID adoption from a woman who used to go to the shelter every day to help with the dogs. And so instead she took this dog into her home. It's a nice dog, but it, it uh, doesn't like her husband particularly. Uh -oh. um, Dr. Anderson, I know you've been very, both been very busy with the more, more animals, more dogs, right? So the same sort of issues that you're seeing? Or? I think so. I mean, I think that we, yeah, as far as the surge and separation anxiety, uh, most of my current clients before COVID have been doing great because their owners are mostly home or have more flexibility. Um, so I haven't really dealt with, um, oh, I had a few, we've had to solely manage like, re you know, returning to work um, and that's going fine. But yeah, I think it's, I guess the only increase in upstate New York has been more adoptions, um, sort of thought it was a good time to get a dog because they were home more, but then unexpected behavioral problems and um, maybe more awareness that there was treatment, which is good. So, um, and the other thing I was thinking about when you were talking was, um, there was one other thing and I can't remember. I'll think of it later, but yeah. And oddly enough, I, I, I'm still waiting for the other shoe to drop with separation anxiety. I don't feel, I think we're all thinking about it. Um, right. And I feel like some animals got worse right after lockdown happened. Cause they're like, why are these people here all the time? Why don't they leave? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> And then we do have a question about, and I think this will be an issue, is, is the puppies who have only known this world, um, only known having their owners around all the time. Um, you know, so now they're, so how do we deal with the, and also under socialization at a young age? Um, so young puppies having their owners gone and they haven't been socialized. Pandemic puppies, basically, <laughs> she cares a lot about. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's hard. They're certainly harder. What was the study, Dr. Haupt, that showed increased risk of COVID? I think it was in Europe for people that were out with their dogs. Yes. I, mean, I, th I think there's there's a lot you can do depending on where you live. I think it would be much harder probably in New York City. Like here we can at least walk around. I don't think puppies need to get closer than six feet to some, you know, there's still a lot of things they can do walking on different types of surfaces, grass, concrete, seeing garbage cans, riding in the car. You know, there's, you don't need to have your puppy in strangers arms all over the place all the time, but seeing people at a distance and rewarding that. So but it's hard because yeah we are limited in in how much we can get out and do different things um so i think doing the best you can and we may see um problems because of it but you know maybe there's some unexpected benefits maybe being a puppy at home during covid they you know develop more of a bond with the family and hopefully that won't fall apart when they sort of go go off to work so i think building independence is really important right um let's see i, I think the same it's just they're saying the under socialization at a young age, now six months old and, and being out more, but experience aggress experiencing aggression towards strangers. Do you feel like that under socialization at a young age can be undone through repetition, repetition and positive experience? I think uh, we have to try. I think yeah. that unfortunately with, with puppies, there's um, an unfortunate thought that they're young and they'll grow out of it. And for what we know, they're they're more likely to grow into it. It's, used, it's more likely to get worse. So seeking treatment as soon as possible. Um, you know, they give you parameters of the best time to socialize a puppy. 
ideally, but if you're not in that time, well, then the second best time is now, you know, you've got to just go and do what you can to improve the situation, but it, it would probably be best to get some guidance from a professional so that, um, cause it's not just about sort of bringing them everywhere and showing them to people. You still have, you have to learn how to watch their body language and how to figure out what, what's happening in that moment. And are they, um, doing okay? Great. Um, we have one about cats. Um, we actually did, we did a weight management lecture last month. Um, and I know that having multiple cats in the same home who are on different diets can be tricky. Um, basically any recommendations for keeping a house where the cats are on different diets that doesn't involve living in separate spaces? Sure, there are these gadgets where the cat wears a magnet that allows only that cat to get into the food dish. Now you can have a, a cat that pushes that cat out of the way. Uh, I've also done the, what I call the Winnie the Pooh technique. And that is you, you have a cage with the food in it and the door is so narrow that only the scrawny cat can get in. The fat cat can't make it through the narrow door and that can help. Great, that's a great tip. Um, we have some several questions about crate training. Um, is that a good idea? Maybe the dog was crate trained when they were younger than not, maybe, is that a good idea to return to that when you go back to work? That's a good question. Um, I didn't mention that. So, um, cause I do actually find surprisingly and maybe Dr. Hupp, you could disagree but I feel like most dogs that we diagnose with separation anxiety don't do well crated. They, they do better outside the crate. So, but we have to do that safely so that they're not being destructive or damaging things. Um, but for the average dog and you know a dog that's not doesn't have separation anxiety i think a crate is a good idea it gives them a safe space to go i certainly used it with my puppies um to teach them how you know a quiet place to go um, it gave them a little safe haven so i think if your dog had the crate at some point in their life and they liked it especially um a crate like an airline crate that's um, plastic where they can't see out of it um, that they're a little more hidden in there. I think that can be great. I think it depends on your dog. Not all dogs are going to love crates. And if that's the case, I wouldn't force it. You know, I wouldn't just keep buying a more industrial crate to keep them in there. Um, you know, either figure out a safer alternative um, or, you know, do something else. But I don't, I don't think crates are, can, can be bad unless they're used in a, incorrectly as punishment or they're in too long. Dr. Haupt, do you have anything to add to that? That was great. No, I, I okay, very complete. <laughs> I walk into a home and I see a wire crate, but it has zip ties on it. I know the dog has separation anxiety. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah, sad because people yeah. think dogs want to be entertained. So they have this open crate and they put it in the window and the dog, uh, you know, can't rest. So uh, that's why the solid crates are better. Great. Um, Okay, here's a question. Two puppies. Um, and I know that many people did get a second dog during COVID to entertain, you know, their, as a friend for their old one, their other dog, sorry, um, who was not able to socialize with other dogs. So um, do you have a, any thoughts on that, first of all, about getting a second dog um, for your other dog? Does that help or are you doubling the problem? <laughs> it's unpredictable. It's we would rarely recommend that as a treatment unless you, I, I have had some dogs with separation anxiety happen upon an, a family dog that does seem to help, but it can be risky because there's a chance that that dog could have its own behavioral problems. They could fight. I think if you want a second dog, you should want that dog not as a fix for your current dog and you should be willing to take on potential problems with that dog. Um, it's not, it's just not predictable that it would be good. I've seen many, many dogs with separation anxiety sitting next to other dogs, still very stressed. And the other dog is really giving them no help. Um, and I think the rule is not followed in the veterinary profession, but no more dogs than people in the house. Um, oh, Cause then if you get six <laughs> dogs and two yeah. people. <laughs> You're outnumbered, right? <laughs> yes, it's yeah. very hard to manage. But I know many, many veterinarians and veterinary professionals with many, many dogs. And, um, and sorry, I have a rule, and that is don't get a dog that's going to grow up to be bigger than your original dog. Because okay. that the big dog will 
realize at some point that it's bigger and life will be difficult for the original dog. And because I, you know, I'm an old woman and my husband taught these beautiful veterinary students, uh, I don't like the idea of replacing a dog before it dies because I didn't want to be replaced by, you know, Dr. Anderson or some other pretty pets. <laughs> no, I agree. I feel very sad when people have an older cat or an older dog and they get a young one to kind of replace it because I think it makes it very hard for the, the older animal. There can be a lot of behavioral issues there. And um, this is sort of off topic, but in the in getting dogs, um, I should mention that I think what 70 to 75% of cases that we see where two dogs in the same house are fighting are two spayed females. So yeah. if you are choosing, it'd be better to get a male and a female, um, not two females, and probably not two males necessarily, but that's not quite as bad. Yeah, it's not quite. Unless they're intact, unless they're not neutered. I know, that's, that's a very good tip. Um, uh, let's see, how about the idea of the, many people will be having a hybrid situation with work, part of the time at home and part of the time at the office. I'm just asking about that. And also for people who are going to maybe insist that they are able to bring their dog to the office. So any way to start training their dog now to be good at an office, you know, it's kind of hard, but. Any tips for preparing a dog to be at an office, but also the oh. hybrid, I think, is a is a big part of it. So, because then you know you're trying to establish this routine. So, how do you juggle that? In my experience, the daytime stuff goes better than nighttime. So, if you have a job that's more of a nine to five, but you're going like two days a week, I think most dogs do better, like getting up, going first thing in the morning in their home. Or and you're saying bringing them to the office or leaving them at home? Well, I think some people are going to have like book a couple of days in the office. I mean, is that harder because you're not, um, some people will be staying home, sorry, not the dog, but the person and the dog. So they'll be home with the dog and then a couple of days in the office. Um, I, I would try to keep it as consistent as possible. And when they're home, try to have the same schedule when they get up and start working and do the mat training and have your dog in a separate room. And then the days you go, you go to work and they're there still in their same place, um, I think. I, obviously, you don't have perfect control over that, depending on your job, you can't always, but it they tend, the more consistent your schedule, the better the dogs tend to do. And the times that I'll make, we'll make a lot of progress with the, with the work schedule, but then we'll have trouble when it's come home, walk the dog, then go out to dinner or Saturdays or Sundays when things kind of go out the window and the schedule changes. So um, dogs do seem to get into a routine, even if it's not every single day of the week. Oh, they absolutely. do seem to get into that routine of if you get up in the morning, kind of do that same routine, but continue to do that independence training when you're home and have them somewhere else in the apartment for a few hours in the morning with their long lasting treat. And that's nap time and um, and try to keep it consistent. And I honestly think um, I mean, I don't have a crystal ball, but I think most dogs that were fine before COVID, you know, after the initial kind of acclimation period will probably be fine again once things get back to some sort of normal. I think we're all struggling to, we don't, you know, we, we, it's changed so much what we're going to expect to do because we all thought we'd be back to work by now. Absolutely. Huh. Um, okay. This will be the last question. Um, when going on vacation, do you recommend hiring a sitter, um, bringing your pet? Um, this is in particular a cat, but we can talk about dogs as well, um, or bringing them to someone else's home. Well, let, let me talk about cats on the dog yeah. and talk about dogs. Uh, leaving the cat in the house is much better. Cats are, are very territorial. And if you move house, the cat may go back to their original house. Uh, so have someone come in and take care of the cat. So that's relatively easy. So Dr. Anderson can answer the rest of it. <laughs> yeah, and I'll just, something flashed up. I've been in a studio apartment. I have no other room. So how do I train my dog to be independent for the same room? You can mat train them next to you and then gradually move the mat further away or, or you can move further away. So just having them be, you know, behind a, you know, room divider or just even on the other side of the room on their mat. Um, as far as dog sitters, I think it depends. M multiple scenarios can work. Um, I actually find some dogs with separation anxiety do better boarding somewhere if they're familiar with it and they know the routine. I think one thing with boarding facilities, if they are, they like it, is that everything's a, a you know set schedule, and some dogs um, really thrive on that. So I've I've had separation anxiety dogs do well. Um, 
whereas they, you know, others do better at home. I think it just depends on a lot of factors. Um, and hopefully with a pet sitter at home, it's someone you can trust. Sometimes that can be risky, um, but you know, it's always stressful to leave your pet in someone else's care. Um, if it's, a, if your dog's really nervous about people coming to the house, um, it's not impossible to find a pet sitter, but it may take time to get someone who's patient enough to come over and get to know them to the point where they can come and walk your dog and feed your dog. I, it, you know, it's difficult. I'm not a big fan of leaving dogs alone with people just coming to feed them and walk them. I think they get a little more stress than cats, but so having someone stay in your house might be preferred, but I think, I think there, there are multiple solutions that might work. Great. Yeah. That's all great information. And thank you both so much for joining us tonight. This was wonderful and, and much needed. Um, we were going to send out the link tomorrow. So um, if you'd like to watch it again, and we'll also send out a list of resources. Um, and we would love to hear from you. So please let us know if there are other topics. Um, you know, we, we will always welcome everyone's input. But Dr. Anderson and Dr. Hout, we are so grateful again for your time and your knowledge and everyone have a great night um, and we will see you soon. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Yes, thank you.